Would you please turn to the book of Ephesians, the book of Ephesians, a letter that Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus. And at the end of this letter, Paul writes this letter, at the end of it, he prepares the church of Ephesus for the spiritual war that's ahead. Ephesians chapter 6. Maybe one of the spiritual wars is finding a seat this morning. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 6. We'll be reading from verse 10 through verse 15. The word of the living God, dear church. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand firm, stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and our verse for this morning, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. The word of the Lord. Let's pray. Our gracious God, it truly is a war. It truly is a spiritual war. Even this morning, perhaps, some are distracted. Perhaps some have cares of the world that need tending to after the service and their minds are already in a place to not receive the word of the Lord. Perhaps some are battling sickness. Perhaps some are battling family issues. Perhaps, perhaps some are battling distresses of anxiety, marital problems, wayward children, Whatever it is, the church for sure is battling persecution. Pastors being arrested, churches being fined in the millions, churches being told to not gather. Meanwhile, the world laughs. So Lord, help us this morning to be equipped for, the, for Christ in this fight by the gospel. Help your word preach to not fall on hard and stony ground, but to fall on fertile soil, Lord, and plant it deep, plant it deep down within us for Christ and his kingdom. Amen. Amen. Well, we've been looking at these different attributes of what it is to be in a spiritual war for Christ, how he tells us to be strong in the Lord because we're weak, how he tells us to prepare, how he tells us to put on the truth around our, our as our belt, because truth undergirds it all. He tells us to put on this uh, breastplate of righteousness, our justification, our sanctification, and we can continue on looking at these developments of this armor that we're called to put on, specifically Christ, specifically his gospel, and this morning, we continue to turn this beautiful gospel, the diamond of the gospel in different directions, continue to look at it and how it applies, the dynamics of it, how it seeps into everyday life. This morning, we'll be looking at gospel shoes and gospel feet. But, but, but before I get into that, I want to tell you a quick story, a missionary story. This story was told to me by a dear friend, and he said he was in Africa. And he was going to preach to a remote village where the gospel had not yet reached. And they needed to get past this very, very oppressive group. So they were traveling by night. They were traveling in, in, during midnight. And if, as long as they made it past a certain gate, they would be safe. But as they're walking in the little byways, in the pitch darkness, with the little flashlight guiding them, at the exact perfect time, these goats all turn their head and look at my friend and the man who was accompanying him. And these goats all storm straight at them. The goats all come charging at them. 
something that was uncalled for, something that was never seen before. Why? Because Satan knew if these men get to that area, the gospel will be preached and the gospel will go out. The gospel is the greatest weapon we have to cause harm and danger to Satan's kingdom. So Satan has one aim. It's to thwart the gospel, to stop the gospel from going out. So Satan loves the vast majority of Christian churches who don't even preach the gospel anymore. Those are why he wants to keep those propped up. He wants to keep those healthy and resourceful because they're doing his work. Satan's great aim is to stop the gospel. That's spiritual warfare. Those men were equipped with gospel shoes heading to a new area and they were stopped by a bunch of goats that were literally going to attack them. Isn't that wild? Hard to believe, I'm sure, in our Western naturalized society. Verse 15. And as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. You know, why is he beginning to address shoes? Well, Paul would, have, Paul would have known what it was like to be a Roman soldier, right? He would have known that they needed the truth, the, 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 the belt around them. He would have known that they, they needed a breastplate upon them to withstand attacks. And next, you know, we think we need a sword now. We think that we need a helmet now. But Paul knew, no, next in line is some good shoes. Have you ever tried to play sports in shoes that weren't good for that sport? Have you ever tried to play soccer on, with cleats? that aren't even there anymore. You slip. Have you ever tried to hike a mountain in flip-flops? You won't make it. Try to walk around for miles in shoes that aren't designed for walking. You're going to be in pain and you're going to be miserable. So Paul knew one of the highest elements that the Roman soldiers consider is having solid shoes. And the way that Roman sandals were, were designed is they would use two pieces of leather and they would use nails that would join the leather, right? So there's nails sticking through, and these nails would operate now as what? As cleats, as traction for the dusty ground. So when they would fight, they would be able to stand their ground. If they were called to hike and to, and to go to terrain that was unsustainable, they had traction on their shoes. Paul knew if Romans, if anything is attributed to the, war, the, to, to, to the Roman army, what they do well is they designed their armor and their attire better than the other nations. In fact, if you read history, they would always say the Romans had the best gear. In fact, many even say the fact that they had solid shoes was the reason they won so many wars because the other soldiers would slip. They couldn't go to certain areas and they would attack. So Paul is not just looking around saying, ah, I guess I'll talk about the shoes now. No, there's a purpose of what's going on. And verse 15 shows us shoes are vitally important in warfare. So, Christ, so Paul applies something to the shoes. But he says there in verse 15, having put on, again, church, week in and week out, all these elements, all these pieces of the armor, I keep on reiterating, you have to put them on. Righteousness of Christ, if you don't understand what that means, you won't ever put it on. The belt of truth, if you're not ever searching out for truth and applying it, you won't ever use truth in your life. And it's no different here in the shoes. You have to fasten them on, have to tie them on, have to some, do something active and intentional to strap your feet with the gospel of Jesus Christ. The verse reads on, having put on, and it says there, look at it with me. Verse 15, having fastened, sorry, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness. What does he mean by readiness? He's getting at, and the basic meaning of the Greek is the readiness, the stronghold, the foundation, the preparedness. Essentially, are you ready for this? Are you prepared for this? Have you been diligently doing all that you can to prepare for the fight? Tie your shoes on, man, is what Paul is getting at. They provide for a strong foundation, a strong ability to march forward. So Paul is getting, he's telling the Christians here, put on the shoes, fasten them on, and be prepared. Prepare yourself for the war. And he ends there in verse 15. The readiness given by the gospel of peace. You know, one of the, the great, I guess, falls of Reformed churches is that they just assume that everyone in the congregation knows the gospel. 
So before I go on, let me just give you a, a, a quick glance at the gospel. We would sum it up in basically four things, creation, fall, redemption, and response. Okay, so what's creation? God created this world perfect and good. God looked out and he created and he said, it's good. He looked at man that he created and the woman he created and said, lo, it's very good. And God said, you can enjoy this entire garden, but don't partake of that tree. You see, God is a God of liberty. God is a God of freedom. He says, enjoy it all. So it's not this one. He didn't give them thousands upon thousands of laws to keep. No, he said, do it all, enjoy it all, love it all, except this one. And what do our first parents, Adam and Eve, do? Our first parents that we all come from, Adam and Eve, they partake of the forbidden fruit and they fall from grace. And now we all sons and daughters of Adam and Eve, now what? We have all been given a sinful nature that we inherited from our first parents. So we have creation, we have the fall, and now we are all utterly lost in sin. We're all sinners this morning. We all have been tainted and completely blemished by the fall of Adam and Eve. And so this, while we understand God's holiness, listen to this. If we're sinners, and if we have sin that we have to pay for, and God says that the punishment of sin is death, who this morning thinks they're going to live? God is holy, and he says, in order for my holiness to be a kept, and in order for my holiness to be maintained, I must punish evildoers. So in everyone's mind this morning, the great question should be, how can sinful man be reconciled to a holy God? If our lot is to be condemned by the holy God, what is the plan of salvation for us? So in our natural state, we all have bad news. That we're sinners lost in Adam, we're sinners who deserve death, we're sinners that are headed toward a path of eternal destruction, except the Lord do something for us. And he did. He sent forth his son. He sent forth the second person of the Trinity. God came into his own, and he took on flesh, and he lived a perfect life, and he went up to the cross. And he suffered for the sins of his people. There you have it, dear church. How can sinful man be reconciled to a holy God? Because God maintains his holiness and justice as he pours out all of his fury and his wrath on his perfect son. So how can God be both the just and the justifier? How can God both condemn the wicked but yet be the upholder of the righteous? How do we get saved? When we trust in the work of Jesus Christ, he gives us his righteousness. As if I live the life that Christ lived, he gives me forgiveness of sins because he punished his son for that. And I receive eternal life. What's your response this morning? Are you responding to the gospel in faith and repentance? God made a way through the perfect sacrifice of his son, Jesus Christ. See, a lot of people don't talk about the wrath of God. They don't even paint the cross as fulfilling the wrath of God. They want to take that out. They want to show you that's the love of God. But how the heck is a man dying, paying for sins? That makes no sense to me. It's because it's the one who's pouring out his justice on that man. And it's the man that's perfect on that cross. Dear church, God created us. We fell from grace. Now we were all born sinners. And we all need the same Savior, Jesus Christ. May I even say it, I command you this morning to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ for the salvation of your sins and the forgiveness of your sins. If you do not respond in that capacity, you remain under Adam and Eve. You remain in your sins. And lest you die in your sins, you still will inherit the damnation for those sins. But why would anyone choose that when we have Christ this morning pleading for us, come to me. All you who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. This morning, the biblical gospel is being offered to you. Will you respond by faith? That's what the gospel of peace is. Sinners now have peace with a God that was once against him. We were once all at enmity with him. And he called us his friends when we came to him by faith, when the Spirit opened our eyes to be able to see Christ for who he is. It's a very quick explanation of the gospel. But I can't assume that we all know it this morning. So moving on, back to the text. As we look at all of this together, we find essentially Paul is saying, get some good shoes. 
Make sure you have a sure foundation. Make sure you strap these shoes on. Make sure that your foundation and your footings are the gospel of peace. Become grounded in the gospel. Advance in the gospel. Do all that you do in the gospel as you move from here to there, as you would stand, as you advance, as you march, whatever you do, Paul's saying, do them with the feet at your feet being the foundation of the gospel of Jesus Christ and apply that to your own heart and take that to the world. You know, he says this elsewhere in Romans 10. He says in for verse 14 and 15, How then will they call on him whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him who, have they, who, have, who they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? Listen to this. As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. So feet here, the gospel shoes, it's the good news. And those feet are beautiful. You find a preacher that preaches you the biblical gospel, there's a sense where you should say, thank you, Lord, for the grace that you've given me because I could be sitting under a preacher who does not preach the gospel. You could have led me to a church where there is no gospel. You see, much like a, a child seeing an Amazon truck pull up with that toy that they've been waiting for, that gift that they've been waiting for, that Amazon truck is ugly. There's nothing beautiful about that. But they know what that Amazon truck carries. It's what they desire. It's what they want. They look out the window. They say, it's here. The package is here. Can we open it this morning? Every time you see someone preaching the gospel, there's a sense where your heart should rejoice and say, thank you that not that that man, but the gospel that that man preaches is beautiful to me. The beautiful feet that bring the gospel, those who labor, those who work, those who make it their duty to make sure that they are preaching the biblical gospel and showing Christ and him crucified. You want to grow a church? Preach health, wealth, and prosperity and everyone will come. You want to grow a church? Have every single agenda for every age, for the two and a half, for the three and a half, for the three and a quarter, for the, you know, do every agenda. Entertain the people to death and the church will explode. You preach the biblical gospel? Oh, that's boring. I don't want that. Oh, the offensive gospel reminding me that I'm a sinner saved by grace? No, but Paul is saying the feet that are strapped with the gospel, those are beautiful feet. Let's turn to Isaiah 52 real quick. It's an Old Testament book, if you're unfamiliar with it. It's a prophecy essentially about the Messiah. Isaiah 52. We'll be reading verse 7. I'll give you some time to turn there. Isaiah 52. If you're not there yet, go ahead and just listen along. Verse 7. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who bring good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. Time and time again, Paul goes to Isaiah to, to show this armor. And remember, Isaiah 52 was right before what? Isaiah 53, which is about the suffering servant who would be pierced for our transgressions. So here in Isaiah, it's an Old Testament passage, but you see the same elements. There's feet that are beautiful. There's a gospel of peace. There's a declaring of good news, of happiness. There's a, there, there's a, 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 a statement, your God reigns. So Paul is saying, someone who has heard the good news, someone who has treasured the good news in their heart. Someone who's been completely captivated and enamored with the good news will therefore go and tell of the good news. You know, in this culture, what would happen is there would be a war happening, right, in foreign lands. And there would be a messenger that would sit up on one of the, the, the mountaintops. That's what it says, how beautiful are the mountains. And he would be surveying the war. Okay, it looks like they're advancing. It looks like they're getting some, 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 
some headway over here, and they would be just looking and looking and seeing what way is this war going. They would fall asleep. They would wake up in the next morning. They'd be continuing to look. Okay, it looks like we're starting to get some, some ground. It looks like we're starting to win. Could it be that we're winning? Could it be that we're winning? And you know what that messenger would do from the mountaintop? He would run back to his homeland declaring, we won, we won, we won. How beautiful are those feet to tell the nations, we won. That's what's going on here. This man in this text is looking at the war and he's saying, we won this morning. This man is looking at the war of sin and death and telling you Christ has won. Christians, Christ has won. The battle is over. Man, those in the remaining city would have been constantly looking out every day. Is he coming back? Is he coming back? And if you would have been coming back slowly with his head down, you would have known we lost. Prepare, start to flee. But if you would have saw him running, cheering, yelling, we won, we won. His dusty feet, his ugly feet, his blistered feet would have been beautiful because he's bringing you the good news of the gospel that they won. There's peace. Our city now has peace. Our country now has peace. So imagine being in a city, being in a jungle, being in a far off remote area where the gospel has never reached and someone coming to you, and that man tells you, there is salvation. There's salvation possible for you. Your sins can be forgiven. There's a video that I watched that I'll never forget. This, this missionary goes to this remote tribe in Africa, and he's preaching the gospel to them. And you see them, they're asking questions. Wait, so you mean that all that witchery that I did, all that black magic I did, all that voodoo that I, that, that, that I did, all those conjurings that I did, you're saying that could all be forgiven. You're saying that the, that the spirits that are against me can have nothing against me any longer. And literally this video shows these Africans jumping up for joy, rejoicing in the Lord, shouting for joy because their sins are forgiven. This morning, church, upon hearing that your sins are forgiven, do you have the same excitement? Do you have the same zeal? Look what it says here back in Isaiah. Verse 8, the, the voice of your watchmen. Remember that man I told you that was watching the war? They lift up their voice. Together they sing for joy. For eye to eye they see the return of the Lord to Zion. Break forth together into singing, you waste places of Jerusalem. For the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord has bared his holy arm before all the... The, the, the eyes of all the nations and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. The whole world knows Christ is the Lord. Christ is the King. Christ is the one who's won it all. And so the whole world wages war against one man. That's Jesus Christ and his bride. Verse 11, depart from there. Depart, go out from there. Touch no unclean thing. Go out from the midst of her. Purify yourselves, you who bear the vessels of the Lord. For you shall not not go out in haste and you shall not go out in flight for the Lord will go before you and the, the God of Israel will be your rear guard. Listen to this. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He's talk, talking about the Messiah now. He shall be high and lifted up and he shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of a child of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him, for that which, which has not been told them they see, and that which they have not heard they have understood. Upon hearing what the Messiah does for us, shouts for joy, singing of praise, happiness, happiness. That's what follows those who hear the biblical gospel. That's what happens when those hear that good news that comes from those beautiful feet and their response is such joy. And you see what he said there. What did the messenger say? Our God reigns. Our Lord reigns. These little kings that try to stand up against our God, no, they don't reign. Our God reigns. So this morning, church, realize your sovereign God who saved you through the work of his son, your God is sovereign. Your God is the only autonomous person and being in this entire universe. What does that mean? There's no one competing with your God. There's no one... There's, there's no one telling your God what to do. God's not wondering if he's able to do something. God is not wondering if someone is, is, is 
hindering his plans. God is not dependent on anyone. God is in sovereign control of all humanity. This morning, dear church, do you take comfort in the fact that the Christian God of the Bible is the one who's bringing all things come to pass and accomplishing his perfect will? God is on his throne, and every single day he's making his enemies his footstool to the ends of the earth. What a beautiful reality. What a beautiful picture for us. Let's go back to Ephesians as we close out. Ephesians chapter 6. We'll begin to apply some of this truth now. So remember, Paul is encouraging the church at Ephesus to be ready for war, to be ready to engage in the battle, in the gospel. And this will do one of this will do two things, sorry. One, it'll fortify fortify our foundation. When we have the gospel strapped to our feet, it gives us as individuals a strong, firm foundation. And as we move forward with the gospel, not only will we have a strong, sure foundation, but we'll know just exactly how to preach that gospel and win the nations to Christ. So if we're going to fight, if we're going to withstand, if we're going to be able to receive the benefits of Christ, we must know those benefits. How do we establish a firm foundation for our feet? As the enemy tries to attack us, listen, we need to keep the gospel as our foundation. Last week we heard about the imputed righteousness given to us by Christ. That's who we are. We're given his perfect life. We stand in Christ. It helps us to grow. But this week, we need to dive deeper into this reality. You see, most people think that the gospel is a shallow reality. Most people think that the gospel is something you learn, four quick steps, four biblical truths. And that's it. They move on from that. No. I remember I heard a sermon once from Paul Washer. And he commanded the church, he said, make it your life's goal to study the gospel of Jesus Christ. And me, being a young believer, thought, well, I already know the gospel. Why would I make it my life's goal to know something that I already know? But I said, you know what? I love Paul Washer. If, I, if this is his recommendation, I'll check him out. And so I grabbed everything I could. I got the word and I tried to study the gospels. I, I got sermons about the gospel. I got books about the gospel. I went into prayer and said, Lord, teach me the gospel. I began a fellowship with others who claim to love the gospel. And let me tell you, after all these years of studying the gospel, I've only found I can't study it enough. I can't get deep enough. I've only made it 10 feet into the cave that is the gospel. So if you think the gospel is shallow, no, the gospel is miles and miles and miles of mines of gold for us to constantly be, be digging up for ourselves. Loving the gospel, appreciating the gospel, applying the gospel, being emotionally and affectionately captured by the gospel. Let me give you some of the benefits of the gospel. You know what the imputed righteousness of Christ gives us? It clothes us. And now we are secure in him. But that's not it. It could be it. And we would have enough. But there's even more. As I look at the benefits that the gospel gives me as his child, he tells me that I'm a co-heir with him. That everything that God has for him, he has for me. The gospel tells me that I have been engrafted into Christ that I have union with Christ, even more so communion with Christ, communion with the Father, communion with the Spirit. As I study the gospel, I see, man, He even gave me His Spirit to indwell in me, to encourage me, to guide me, to lead me on, to convict me of my sin, to lead me to truth, and to lead me to Christ. As I study the gospel, I see He's given me baptism to remind myself of my union with Him. He's given me the Lord's Supper week in and week out to feast upon the means of grace that is Christ, to remind me of his body that was broken and his blood that was spilt. As I study the gospel, I think about the fact that Christ's work was completely accepted by the Father. How long have you studied the propitiation of Christ for sins? Have you stood there for hours realizing what Christ did on the cross for you? As I study the gospel, I think about the fact that 
God has adopted me into His family. As I study God's decree, God's providences, God's wisdom, God's, God's triunity, God's forbearance, God's word, God's glory, God's eternal paradise for His people, God's justice, God's wrath, satisfied in Christ, God carrying out His history of redemption, Christ's sinlessness given to me to be covered in. As I consider that the word tells me that Jehovah is my shepherd, I could stay there all day considering that benefit of the gospel. Jehovah is my shepherd. I shall not want. Christ is my shepherd. He leads me to, 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 to the beautiful fields. You see what I'm saying? There's so many benefits of the gospel for your soul this morning. And you're content with knowing the most shallow understanding of the gospel. As a, and I'm just naming these things. We could spend hours talking about each and every one of, them, uh, one of these, but if you realize that God has adopted us by the gospel, and now all these benefits come flowing to your life, all of these, these beautiful benefits of Christ come to you, you can withstand anything, dear church. You can embark on the path and know whatever stands in my way, I know these beautiful benefits of the gospel. Why would I be discouraged when I have God's adoption ministering to me? When I have God's decree telling me this is all part of His plan? When I have His goodness saying He will always be faithful to us? See, the gospel must permeate every single area of life if it's going to be gospel shoes that give us a firm foundation. Because of the gospel, now we could say the gospel and marriage, the gospel and fighting sin, the gospel and raising children, the gospel and intimacy, the gospel and work, the gospel and preaching, the gospel and church, the gospel and everything is what I'm saying. If we don't do it all in light of the gospel, it's going to be a shallow, shallow reality for us. And the more that we become equipped in the gospel for our own sake, the more prepared we'll be able to go out and to preach the gospel. You know, they say the best offense is a solid defense. So the more that we become truly captivated by the gospel, this is what happens. Christians don't know the gospel. So they go out to the street and they begin to meet different types of people. Let's say you meet someone who's struggling with feeling loved. They feel like no one can love them. How do you preach the gospel to, to that individual? Do you harp on man's depravity and man's depravity? They already know that. So no, you approach them through the gospel of teaching them the adoption that is offered for those who trust in Christ. What about if you go out and you reach someone that says, oh, I'm good, I'm self-righteous, essentially. Do you tell them how the adoption is ready for them? No, with them, you would apply the gospel and show man's depravity and how you need to be saved from your depravity. But see, because Christians don't know the gospel, they just preach this one plain message, never ever dealing with the hearts of different types of individuals. You know, when you do pastoral counseling, you see, okay, I need to apply the gospel to this person's life in this way. When you meet people in your workplace, you meet people on the street, your family, you realize it's the one gospel, but I can always come at it from this angle or from this position. But if you don't know the gospel... How are you going to preach the gospel to anyone? How are you going to find where that person is and apply the gospel to their life and to show them how they have freedom in Christ if they trust in Him? See, this gospel of peace, when we truly are saturated in it, when our own hearts are moved by it, it'll do one thing, dear church. It'll make all of us go and tell the nations. That man from Isaiah, running from the mountain. He first believed that the war was won, and it was such precious news to him that he went and told everybody else. He was captivated by what he saw. So this morning, we must go out and tell lost souls that the war is won, that there's now peace available for all who trust in him, that if you want to join the winning side, the winning side is the side of King Jesus. So these gospel shoes of peace, Listen, they should move us. Shoes are made for walking, as the old song says, but I know it says boots, but it's all good. Shoes are meant for walking. 
If someone is not walking in the gospel, someone is not taking the gospel out, my question is, do they really love the gospel? If someone is not about the work of the gospel, I have to wonder to myself, do they cherish the gospel? If they cherish the good news, you couldn't keep their mouth shut. We stand in the gospel, we walk in the gospel, we move in the gospel. I pray this morning that I say the gospel enough. I've said it a thousand times this morning, but it's because we need to know what the centrality of Christianity is. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. So this morning, for our church, go and tell the nations, dear church. Go and tell your neighbors. Go and tell your family. Go and rejoice and tell them all that King Jesus has won. May your feet be beautiful feet in the lives of many. You're the one who preached the gospel to me. Thousands walked by, thousands walked by, and no one slowed down to take the time to tell me the beautiful news of the gospel. No one even warned me that I was in bad news. May we be a church that we're all strapped on with the shoes and the gospel of peace. That one day, souls that were dying looked at us and said, because of your beautiful feet, I'm now a Christian. Because of your feet that walked that hard path and had to go through those awkward conversations and bring up awkward topics and feel uncomfortable at times. But you went to that great length because my soul was that important to you and you preached the gospel to me. Remember, church, souls are dying every single day. So how long will you keep the gospel to yourself? How long will you just keep the gospel for your own benefit and for your own happiness? Amen and amen that it should be your benefit and your happiness. But how long will you keep this wonderful news from your friends and from your loved ones and from those that you care about? If you aren't moved to preach the gospel, I wonder, do you really love the gospel? Our God reigns. He saved us through the purchase of his son. And now we go out with this powerful gospel of Jesus Christ and declaring, he's done it, dear church. He's done it, world. Forever he is glorified. He's done it. And Satan hates a Christian who loves the gospel. Satan hates a Christian who knows how to apply the gospel to his own life. Satan hates every single time the gospel gets out. So realize, realize, that Satan is winning the war when he keeps your mouth shut about the gospel. When you begin to focus on the, the, the cares of this world and the stress of this life, and you take your eyes off how the gospel helps you to, to, to rage a war against him, Satan is winning against you. Know that we would truly be a small little church here that's Christ-centered and that ultimately makes it our aim. Lord's Day after Lord's Day, month after month, prayer meeting after prayer meeting, fellowship hangout after fellowship hangout, that this little church would be known as the church that preaches the gospel of Jesus Christ over all areas of life for the hope of society and the nations. Jesus purchased us with his own blood, dear church. Jesus purchased us with his own blood. Strap these gospel shoes on and go and tell the world of this beautiful news of the gospel. Let's pray. Our gracious God, we're thankful that you give us a full, complete, robust, full of benefits gospel. Oh, that we would see all these benefits coming to us. The benefits of the gospel of adoption, of, of propitiation, of perseverance of the saints of being co-heirs with Christ, of your providence being for us, of your decree being for our good, of your wisdom applied to our lives. Lord, there's so much to feast upon, upon in the gospel. Lord, may we not be hoarders of the gospel. May we love it and cherish it, but may we also be sharers of the gospel. Help us to be a church that takes the gospel, applies it to our life, and preaches it to the nations. In Christ's name, amen.